Hi, this is Ms. Wright, and I am going to talk about excerpts from Chapter 51 of Great Expectation, specifically the parts where Pip confronts Mr. Jaggers about Estella's past. So we have Mr. Jaggers nodded his head retrospectively two or three times and actually drew a sigh. Pip said he, we won't talk about poor dreams. You know more about such things than I, having much fresher experience of that kind. But now about other, about this other matter, I'll put a case to you, mind it. Mind, I admit nothing. Okay, so when um, Mr. Jaggers talks about poor dreams, these are Pip's aspirations to become a gentleman and attain Estella that he's had since he was a young boy and Mr. Jaggers it alludes to the fact that maybe once a very long time ago he also had dreams of maybe finding love or something and never did. Uh, the phrase put to case is going to become a refrain in this part of the chapter it comes back over and over and over again. Sometimes it's in the form of anaphora, beginning a phrase. Sometimes it's epistrophe, where it's ending a phrase. It also appears as anadiplosis, where it's both ending and beginning a phrase. But it, the author uses it over and over again because he's setting up the idea that as an attorney, Jaggers cannot admit to any... Um, thing that is illegal or anything where he might one day be called into court to testify. So he's saying this as a hypothetical. So when he says put a case, he's um, just using it as though, oh, this didn't really happen, but this could have possibly happened. He's keeping that um, ambiguity there. So he's never fully responsible for admitting that these are facts. He waited for me to declare that I quite understood that he expressly said that he admitted nothing. Okay, and that's important. Now, Pip said, Mr. Jaggers, put this case, put the case that a woman under such circumstances, I call this anadiplosis, even though it's slightly different, but it's basically the same phrase coming at the end of one sentence and then beginning the next sentence that a woman under such circumstances as you have mentioned held her child concealed and was obliged to communicate the fact to her legal advisor on his representing to her that he must know with an eye to the latitude of his defense how the facts stood about that child put the case that at the same time he held a trust to find a child for an eccentric lady to adopt and bring okay so as readers of the book we know that the woman that he's talking about here would be molly who we find out is um estella's mother and the eccentric lady there's only one of those that's miss havisham so at the same time that he was defending molly for a murder charge he was also asked by miss uh, havisham to find a little girl that she could adopt and raise and he is going to set up a situation with molly he's basically going to corner her in a sense and um compel her to give up Estella uh, if he wants if she wants him as the attorney. I follow you, sir, that's Pip. Put the case that he lived in an atmosphere of evil and that he saw of and that all he saw of children was their being generated in great numbers for certain destruction. Put the case that he often saw children solemnly tried at the criminal bar where they were held up to be seen. Put the case that he habitually knew of their being in prison, whipped, transported, neglected, cast out, qualified in all ways for the hangman, and growing up to be hanged. So here's the um, put the case that is anaphora but then and also here but most importantly he's telling us what his 
motivation was for giving Estella to Miss Havisham because if we don't know this, we think that he must have been a very evil man to participate in Miss um, Havisham's scheme to raise up a child to um, wreak revenge on the male sex, but there was a greater, more compelling uh, issue at hand, and he he explains it here when he says he lived in the atmosphere of evil and we know that he thinks this because this is why he's always washing his hands he feels like he's surrounded by the all the the dirt and grime of the world in terms of having to deal with certain people and he's constantly washing his hands and it, and this passage here also brings into mind a certain amount of social criticism that is a part of the book because in England there was no social network for um, poor people even children children would roam the streets they would steal they would get into all kind of trouble if their parents had died there was no one to take care of them and you had these bands of children just living on the streets. You see it in the Sherlock Holmes um, books and you see it in Charles Dickens books where they are just um, uh, adolescents and uh, preteens and young children who had to forage for themselves in order to survive and many of them became great thieves. So when he says that um, they were generated for the for certain destruction. Of course, they would end up um, spending gr a great amount of time in jail. So uh, when we look at uh, Magwitch's backstory and he talks about being took up, took up, took up, it means he was often caught and taken off to jail. He had to spend time in jail. They would let him out. He would need a way to survive. He would steal again and he would get put back in jail again. So most of his adolescence was spent um, in and out of jail. And this is something that Magwitch, uh, not Magwitch, Jaggers, um, viewed or saw over and over, over and over again. So when he says, um, often saw children solemnly tried at the criminal bar, children, eight, nine, ten years old, would be brought before the court. Now they would have to go to a, a separate kind of ju juvenile dis uh, detention, but there they would be thrown in with adults, with hardened criminals if they were found guilty. They could even be hung if they were found guilty, which is something that we don't do to children um, today. We don't uh, execute children. There's a sense that um, there's always some hope that this child can be um, redirected and uh, rehabilitated. But he names all these things. They would be in prison. They would be whipped. They would be transported out of the country. They would be neglected, cast out, and qualified always for the hangman and growing up to be hanged. Put to case that pretty nigh all children he saw in his daily business life had reason to look upon he had reason to look upon so much spawn and spawn are um, the tiny little uh, eggs that come from fish that will grow into larger fish but most of those spawn are eaten by other fish other marine life and only a few grow to be adult fish and so here he's saying that there were so many children and most of them would be just devoured or consumed or destroyed by society and that only a few would ever have the chance to really grow up, um, to develop into the fish that were to come to his net, meaning that um, would have to come into his office for him to defend them against all kinds of crimes, to be prosecuted, defended, forsworn, made orphans. And I underlined orphans here because orphans is one of the motifs in the book. If you think back, many of the characters lose their parents. Um, Joe loses both of his parents. Pip loses his parents. Um, Magwitch loses his parents. So being um, orphan is something that recurs and it's also part of the social criticism here because once you became an orphan society made no provision for your welfare. Um, made orphans be deviled somehow. I followed you sir put the case 
Pip, that there was one pretty little child out of the heap who could be saved. And this is Estella. She must have been a beautiful little girl that he decided he just had to try to save her, whom the father believed dead. And by now you should know that the father is Magwitch, and dared make no stir about as to whom over as to whom over the mother the illegal adviser had his power. So because Jaggers was defending Molly, he had a certain amount of power. If she didn't do what he said, she was afraid that um she would end up um hanged and that her child would be relegated to the streets so he uses that control and we saw his power over his clients from the very beginning when he um talks to his clients in such an abrupt manner i know not what you i know what you did and how you did it you came so and so this was your manner of attack and this was the manner of resistance you went so and so you did such and such thing to divert suspicion i have tracked you through it all and i tell it all i and i tell it all you all part with the child unless it should be unnecessary to produce it to clear you and then it shall be produced give the child into my hands and i will do my best to bring you off if you are saved your child is saved too if you are lost your child is still saved put to case this was done and the woman was cleared so he basically gives her this argument that look if i get you off then your child is saved. But if I am unable to get you off, then your child still will be saved because she'll be with someone who can take care of her. And he ends up clearing Molly, says, I understand you perfectly, but I make no admissions. That you make no admissions. And Wemmick repeated, no admissions, that's epistrophe. Put the case, Pip, that passion and the terror of death had little shaken the woman's intellect intellects and that when she was set to liberty she was scared out of the ways of the world and went to him to be sheltered so after molly is cleared of the murder charge which she do actually does commit um she doesn't know what to do and she has no more child the child is gone so she goes to mag uh jackers for shelter and that's how she becomes his maid also notice here you have um, strong alliteration. You have um, was, ways, world, went. So Jagger shows her a certain amount of mercy by taking her in and allowing her to be his maid. Put to case that he took her in and that he kept her down, kept down the old wild, nat violent nature whenever he saw an inkling of it breaking out by asserting his power over her in the old ways do you comp comprehend the um imaginary case and pip says quite put to case that the child grew up and was married for money that the mother was still living that the father was still living <clears throat> you have epistrophe again here that the mother and the father unknown to one another were dwelling within so many miles furlongs yards if you like of one another that the secret was still a secret except that you had got wind of it put that last case to yourself very carefully i do i ask wemmick to put it to himself very carefully and wemmick said i do for whose sake would you reveal the secret for the father's i think he would not be much better for the mother for the mother's i think if she had done such a deed she would be safer where she was <clears throat> for the daughters i think it would be hard hardly serve her to establish her parentage for the information of her husband and to drag her back to disgrace after an escape of 20 years um pretty secure for the last um secure to last for life okay i'm going to stop here and i'm going to continue on with the second part where we round up um mark mag uh, jagger's argument and where we also talk about what type of rhetorical um uh, argumentative 
tactic he's using throughout this passage. Okay, see you.